Good evening, everyone. Please welcome to the Tuesday, March 28th, 2023, regular meeting of the Marple Newtown School Board. I'm going to call this meeting to order, noting that the board just met in executive session to discuss personnel and legal matters. At this time, if we could all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. John, would you lead us? Yep. I pledge, I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America, America and to, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call. Ms. Alberti. Here. Mr. Bilker. Here. Mr. Desi. Here. Ms. Harvey. Here. Mr. Maloof. Here. Mr. McKenzie. Here. Mr. Reynolds. Here. Mr. Ciano. Here. Ms. Tomasco. Here. All members present this evening. Thank you. Approval of the agenda. Is there a motion to accept the agenda as presented? Move. Second. Any board discussion? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? The ayes have it. Number five, public comments, agenda items only. Seeing none. All right, so uh, I'm Justine Lehigh. I'm a resident of Marple Township. Um, and my husband and I have three daughters, two of which are at Russell Elementary School. Um, it goes back to what I stood up and said at the February 28th meeting that item number 11 on the agenda states several settlement agreements and tuition agreements regarding students whose needs we could not meet in our district, where by law they are entitled to receive a free and appropriate public education. Um, I had suggested that going forward it might be helpful to eliminate acronyms that the public may not be privy to when posting the public agenda. Uh, there was a motion at the meeting, I believe, to fix that so that it does read free and appropriate public education because some members of the board were not even sure what it stood for. Um, I did not see that fixed in the previous agenda's minutes or in tonight's um, agenda. That's all. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Number six, we are proud of our students and teachers. Thank you. Um, this evening, I just wanted to share that uh, we are really proud of the cast, crew, and orchestra pit for the musical The Addams Family. I know many board directors went. It was, it was really a spectacular performance, spectacular. And um, the, the, I mean, the set was beautiful. The kids were terrific. They really, really were outstanding. And I just really wanted to just say we're really proud of them. So that concludes my report. <laughs> number seven commendations uh, none this evening number eight student representatives report Matt good evening uh, Matt here uh, Kyria unfortunately could not attend she and the lacrosse team are taking on Conestoga tonight um, in girls lacrosse um, so on Tuesday, March 21st, the National, the Science National Honor Society took a trip to the DCIU um, campus to help judge the STEM competitions um, among multiple public middle schools um, throughout the county. And then, as uh, Dr. Kane pointed out, there we had recently had the Adams Family play. I went. Um, I saw a lot of people there. There was, it was pretty much packed every night from what I heard, and I, I thought it was very funny. Um, and everybody, all my friends were in it. They loved it, and uh, it's a great program we have. Um, this week, the Marple Newtown students are helping to host Reading Olympics for various elementary schools in the area. Um, that's happening at the high school. I was there last night helping some of the kids around get to the rooms, and a lot of them are very excited. There's the local um, Marble Newtown School District schools, and then there are the ones from the surrounding school districts. Um, coming up will be the annual uh, Murph basketball tournament, which will take place on Friday, April 14th, during the day to celebrate Mr. Murphy, who was a teacher at our school. Um, and the money that is raised by that basketball tournament will go towards a scholarship for um, one of the students at graduation. And then the prom is coming up. That'll be May 5th. Um, and we're starting to get ready for that. Tickets will go on sale, I believe, the week we come back from 
spring break, which is next week too. And then spring sports, most of the teams have started in, uh, officially in their official capacities. Boys lacrosse won their first game against Great Valley. Girls lacrosse won their first game against Pottsgrove. Um, boys track and girls track both had their opening meets at the Upper Darby Relays. I believe the girls took second in the four by mile, setting a school record, and the boys <coughs> SMR took third overall. Um, yesterday, there was also the home openers um, softball. Theirs was scheduled. They won, if Mr. Show, you correct me, 17 to 2 against Strathaven. Um, and then the boys had a surprise home opener. Unfortunately, Strathaven's field got ra- rained out, so they played at home um, for their home opener. And then on Thursday, March 23rd, the National Honor Society took a trip to Washington, D.C. It was very cool to see. We went to Arlington National Cemetery, got to see multiple. Uh, we got to see the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier and the Changing of the Guard. We also took a couple of visits to um, certain graves, such as the, the Supreme Court justices, and along with visiting all the other memorials in Washington. And then finally, juniors are in the process of completing their junior initiative pro- project, and they have been visiting various sites throughout the community. Um, for future job occupations, and then presentations will start the week of April 14th. And that is pretty much what's going on at the high school, so thank you. Thanks, Matt. Number nine, superintendent's report. Thank you. Um, I have a few things to share. Uh, I was also sharing about the Reading Olympics. I saw you, I was, we, you and I were both directing traffic yesterday at the high school. So the, um, the Reading Olympics is through the whole county, and each school district takes a turn, and it's our turn, and it's really a wonderful event. Uh, last night, so we're hosting like all week. Last night was um, uh, Warrell and Loomis, and both of our schools won against their, their teams, which was dynamite. And then um, we tonight is, is uh, Russell and Colberton, so good luck to, duck to them. It's going on right now. And then tomorrow night is the middle school, and Thursday is the high school. So good luck to all of our teams. Spring sports opened, uh, started rather, and I wish our teams and our athletes luck. We also, uh, I was also going to highlight that um, the DCIU hosts a STEM challenge. We sent 12 elementary teams and 11 middle school teams to participate. And um, we're eagerly waiting for our results. We don't, we don't know the results of that yet. But the children had a great time um, making prototypes uh, about climate and the environment. And so I'm really hopeful that our students did well. They had a great time. Pax and Hollow. Um, had a, a great performance as well with uh, their drama club, uh, Pure Imagination. The, it was um, not a big elaborate set because you had to use your imagination. The kids did a really great job and it was very well attended. Uh, it was really proud of them for that. Colbertson um, is doing a fundraiser for the Ronald McDonald House. They raised um, $8,300. They raised so much money, they're actually in the top 10 ranked in the Philadelphia region, and they're going to get an award for that. So it's really great of their students and the, and their staff um, and the families for raising all of that money. Colbertson's also doing their second annual March Madness. It's a lot of fun. They make videos, and the kids, they started out with 16 books. Next week is the... Um, is the last, uh, I think this week rather, is the last week of the championship. And so we'll, we'll see who, who wins the championship for the kids, kids voting. Um, Loomis is doing something slightly different with their March Madness where um, for every 15 minutes they read, their principal, Miss Smythe, will have to climb over 100 feet to the sky on the, on the Broomall Fire Company ladder. Don't know if we have insurance for that, Joe, but I, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna let the kids have fun. So, um, no, in all honesty, it's just a fun way to get – the kids are really going to enjoy watching her climb that ladder. And uh, Russell, they, they're, they're busy with um, careers. They're learning about careers in third grade, and they're going to teach the second graders what they learn for their career days. And um, they also uh, – at Warrell – they're doing uh, Cradles for Crayons, which they, they do annually, and that, that will be a big success. And um, Worrell has two events for parents coming up, and that's a, a mini, mini golf fourth grade parent night this week. I, I went to the mini golf yesterday. It was really terrific. I was with the kindergarten class. They had these little mini uh, putters, and they were they're adorable. They made them out of Toy Story and Legos. It was really clever. 
super fun. And they're also, the second grade is going to do a hobby and collection show later on in the week. So good luck to those students. And that concludes my report. Number 10, Secretary's minutes. Uh, is there a motion to approve the minutes from the February 28th, 2023 regular meeting? So moved. Second? Is there a second? Second. Okay. okay. Board discussion? I have one thing. Yes. I just want it noted that the February 2023 20, minutes do indeed uh, have the acronym FAPE in parenthetical and the full free and appropriate public education act listed in, in text. It, it's in the minutes. Yeah. Thank you. I'll move that it's changed on the current agenda. Okay. Good move. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it. Do I have a, a motion um, for the district moves to correct the January 24th, 2023 regular meeting minutes to add at the end of the legislative report the following language, which was inadvertently omitted from the minutes? Do I have a motion? So moved. Second? So Board discussion? I'll just quickly say this is a part of my report that whatever reason didn't make it into the minutes. So thank you in advance for correcting that. Okay, we had a first and second correct. Yep. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it. Uh, number 11, other reports. I'm going to put those five mo motions together. Is there a motion to approve the other reports? Item number 11. So moved. Is there a second? Board discussion on any of them? Sorry, sorry, Desiree. Uh, can the minutes reflect the phrase free and appropriate education act in article, in the last three articles of this motion? Please. There's no objection to that. No objection. No. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it. That concludes my report. Thank you, Desiree. No, number 12, Curriculum Instruction and Technology Committee. All right. Is there a motion for 12.02? to approve the first reading of reviews for policy 201, admission of students and policy 204, attendance as presented. So moved. Is there a second? Board discussion. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? The ayes have it. Motion approved. 12.03, is there a motion for state testing schedule? So moved. Second. Board discussion. All in favor? Aye. 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 The ayes have it. 12.04, Summer Learning Program. Is there a motion to approve the 2023 Summer Learning Programs at the elementary and the middle school levels as presented? So moved. Second. Board discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion approved. The ayes have it. 12.05, Credit Recovery at Marple Newtown High School. Is there a motion to approve the credit recovery at the high school as presented? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Board discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The ayes have it. 12.06, Marple Newtown High School course description change. Is there a motion to approve the Marple Newtown High School course description changes as presented? Okay. Board discussion? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? The ayes have it. Motion approved. 12.07, responsive classroom agreement. Is there a motion to approve the agreement for two days of training with responsive classroom as presented? The so cost of training is separate. Okay. Is there a second? Yeah. Board discussion? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? The ayes have a motion to approve. 12.08, star of the day workshop. Is there a motion to approve the Marple Newtown Drama Club to host a star of the day series? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Board discussion? Sounds wonderful to me. It does. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? The ayes have a motion to approve. 12.09, best buddy ball. Is there a motion to approve the Marple Newtown Best Buddy Club to host the Best Buddies Ball May 6, 2023? So moved. Second. Board discussion? I also think it's wonderful. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes Any opposed? Sorry. The ayes have it. Motion approved. 12.10, Immaculata University Agreement. Is there a motion to approve the agreement between Marple Newtown and Immaculata University for dual enrollment offerings as presented? So moved. Second. Board discussion? All right. Any, uh, all in favor? Say aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have a motion to approve 12.11 Marple Newtown School District K through 12 guidance plan. A motion to approve the Marple Newtown School District K through 12 guidance plan as presented. So moved. Second. Board discussion. The aye. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it. Motion to approve. 12.12 administrative trips. Is there a motion to approve 
looks like we have one, two, three, four, four so motions. Moved. Five. Five. Thank you for that. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Board discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. The ayes have a motion approved. 12.13, some student trips. We have one, two, three, four, five, six trips so we're voting moved. on here. Perfect. Do we have a second? Second. Board discussion? All in favor? Aye. aye. Any opposed? The ayes have it. Motion approved. 12.14, book disposal. Is there a motion to approve the disposal of books from Royal Elementary School as presented? So moved. Second. Board discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it. Motion approved. We got three more here. 12.15, Marple Newtown High School marching band and parkas disposal. Is there a motion to approve the disposal of the old Marple Newtown High School marching band parkas? So uh, it's a classic item. Second. Any board discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The ayes have it. Motion approved. Two to go. 12.16, Marple Newtown High School marching. There's a 12.06 as well. Is there a motion to approve the purchase of new parkas? Of the Marple Newtown High School band so students. Moved. Second. We have a second. Second. Board discussion. Just wanted to point out that that's item number twelve. Twelve point one six. Yeah. What did I say? Sorry. Six. Ooh, sorry. Thanks for catching that. Sure. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The ayes have a motion approved. Twelve point one zero technology. Is there a motion to approve the finance of checkpoint security? Would I just do one six that time? <laughs> Sorry, trying to move it. I apologize. 12.17, is there a motion to approve the finance for checkpoint security firewalls through HP Financial Services? So moved. moved. Is there a second? Second. Board discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The ayes have a motion approved. And that is, concludes my segment. Thank you, Mr. Ciano. Number 13, Human Resources and Policy Committee. Mr. McKenzie? Uh, can I get a motion to approve agenda items 1302? 1313, so moved. Second. Uh, board discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Ayes have it. Thank you. Number 14, Budget and Finance Committee. Ms. Alberti? So moved. Second. Aye. Aye. Uh, facilities and I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. Facilities and Transportation Committee, Mr. Reynolds. Thank you. Companies get a motion for 1502. Second. Any board discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, motion carries. I conclude my report. Thank you. Delaware County Intermediate Unit Report, Ms. Harvey. Uh, no report this evening. Okay. Legislative report? Yes, yes, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, when I gave the uh, legislative report in January, I did remark on the composition of the Pennsylvania General Assembly being a bit uncertain because of the vacancies. It is still precarious because of uh, two vacancies which continue. I will point out that one of those vacancies is here in Delaware County in the district just to the east of us, and another is up in Montour County. So hopefully uh, the General Assembly will be fully, uh, fully staffed, for the lack of a better term, um, by the end of the spring. I will point out also that there is a, since I last gave the January legislative report, there is a new speaker of the House of Representatives. Her name is Joanne McClinton. She is a Democrat from Philadelphia. This uh, marks, she was elected at the end of February. This marks the first time in the history of the Commonwealth that both legislative chambers have elected female leadership with the state Senate also um, being headed up by the president pro tempore Senator Kim Ward of Westmoreland County, uh, a Republican from Westmoreland County. Um, the reason this is, this is relevant is, again, the spending. The spending depends on the state legislature. So that would be the State House of Representatives and the State Senate. So um, one more footnote on uh, Senator Ward. She briefly served as Lieutenant Governor for the Commonwealth in early January. So uh, more to come on that in the months ahead. Thank you, Mr. Maloof. Board President's report to the board. 
Um, so I want to have a minute to talk about why I think the vast majority of you are all here tonight. Um, we are in contract negotiations with the teachers union. Um, and I just wanted to address some things. I mean, it's been, an, it's been an interesting few months for for teachers. It's been an interesting few months for school directors. It's been an interesting few months for community members. Um, there have been things that have been pointed out by the teachers union and by community members that you are 100% right about. Um, this district has had decades and decades and decades a very conservative fiscal policy. And I think we're at a point where, like in many ways, it's caught up with us with regard to retention. Um, and it's caught up with us in regard to attraction of new employees. And certainly, and I think this is, you know, for better or worse, something that's pretty new over the past year or so. Um, I think some of our employees our teachers, our, our M&EA members um, think that, feel that their loyalty to our school district um, is not getting the credit that it's due. Um, we agree. We agree with that. Um, the question is how do we fix it? Those principles, those objectives are guiding us through this process. Um, and they're guiding, and they're guiding, I, I believe, and I don't want to speak for them, but I believe they're guiding uh, m &E as well. The question is how do we get to a point where we have an agreement so that these objectives can be met or so that we can move the needle in a direction, um, in a certain direction that, that factors in when a teacher or an employee or an m &E member is thinking about leaving our school district. Um, but we have heard, we, we've heard you, and those are, those, are, those are things that are really important to us. Uh, we're going to open this up for public comment very shortly. What, I, what I, I, I just want everyone in here to know is not one of the nine of us is interested at, at disrespecting or dividing uh, anybody in this room. Um, this is this is something that we want to get done. Um, for myself, I went through the district. I've got at least one teacher in this room who used to teach me. I got a teacher in this room who I grew up with. Um, I got teachers in this room who teach teach my kids. Tony went to the district. Desiree's kids went through the district. Nick Reynolds went through the district, taught at the district, and has kids who go through the district. John McKenzie has kids in the district. Dave Desi has kids in the district. Tracy has kids who went through this district. This is important to us. I, I, I guess that's what I want, I want to stress. And so when I say we're not intended, we don't want to, nothing that we're doing, you know, we want this to be a respectful process. And I recognize that people are gonna be, they're, they're, public comment's open. You can say what you want, but know that from us, we're not directing any, we understand is the point that I guess I'm trying to make as I r ramble through this. Um, we're not, uh, I'm not, we're not looking to attack or demean. We are proud of our teachers. Um, we care about our teachers and we're committed to working to get this done. Um, so before turning this over to public comment, um, because again, I just think it's important that there's things that I th I'm sure you guys are going to point out, and, and we agree with a lot of them. It's just a matter of how do we solve that. Um, I asked Mrs. I'm going to ask Mr. Serini. We were back in executive session. Um, I'm going to ask the board had wanted Mr. Serini to to tie off a loop from the last meeting about whether or not something we were doing was legal or illegal, and I thought it might be helpful because there's so many people here who. Um, might not regularly attend school board meetings, just for, to just briefly touch on what public comment is. Um, thanks, Mark. Thank you, Mr. Bilker. On the first topic, at the March 14 public committee meetings, a member of our school community raised a concern about a possible violation by our district of, a, of something called the 
Public School Financial Transparency Act. And I uh, spoke with the member of our community afterwards. We had a very nice conversation. And uh, she showed me the source of her understanding. And it turns out it was pretty confusing. But it actually is a, what's referred to as a model act or a model law, a proposed law. Pennsylvania has not adopted that law. The federal uh, body, uh, Congress, has not adopted that law. So it is not actually a law. It's a proposed bill that a, a um, I guess you would call it a lobbying body, is trying to convince the various legislatures throughout the United States to pass. So it is not actually a law that Pennsylvania uh, uh, has enacted or that Congress has enacted. So <clears throat> uh, it turns out that we are not violating that because it is not a law. But I do appreciate the, uh, the concern that was raised. I also appreciate the manner in which the member of our community and I communicated, and we got to the bottom of it, and that takes care of that. The other uh, topic Mr. Bilker asked me to address was public comment. I did make some extensive comments about that last meeting, and I was reminded afterwards by some board members that I am not paid by the word, so therefore I will keep these comments uh, more brief. The, uh, the law that enables members of our school community, specifically taxpayers and, and residents, to make public comment at school board meetings is called the Sunshine Act. It's a Pennsylvania law that says that taxpayers and residents of our district have the right to come up to the podium and make public comment. Uh, the, the law specifically says comment. It does not say uh, you have the right to ask a question and get an answer. You certainly have the right to ask a question, but there is no obligation on the part of the board to give you an answer. So it, it really is a comment session. It's not a debate session. And I can tell you that our board's philosophy is they want to encourage public comment and not get into debate and not to do anything to appear to stifle the comments. Um, along with that right to come up and make public comment, as I mentioned before, also, you, you bear with you responsibility. And your responsibility, of course, is not to engage in what is referred to as defamation. And defamation basically means that the comment is attacking a person, it's directed at a person, and you're making a false assertion of fact about that person, either negligently or recklessly or worse yet, intentionally, that damages that person's reputation. So our board's position is that we don't want anybody, including me, to act as a referee of public comment. So we don't, if we hear what we think is defamatory, we're not going to stop the comment, I would say, generally speaking. But along with that right to speak comes the responsibility to make sure if you are going to make an assertion of fact about somebody else that could potentially affect that person's reputation, that you, you be careful in making sure that you're making a, a factual assertion, a true fact. Now, uh, one last thing I want to point out is under defamation law, that is, there's the category of making assertions of fact, and then there's opinion. You, you are always fine if you're expressing your opinion. You cannot be held responsible for defamation if you express an opinion. Like I joked before about the solicitor, uh, you know, whatever you might, whatever terms come to mind about a lawyer, you can express the opinion that, that the solicitor is arrogant or obnoxious or dumb. Those are not facts, those are opinions. But if you, if you make an assertion of fact that the solicitor, for example, went into somebody's pocketbook and stole that person's purse in the middle of the meeting, and that's not true, that would obviously be a false assertion of fact that would tend to damage the solicitor's reputation. And if you're making it carelessly, recklessly, or, or intentionally, that would rise to the level of defamation. So 
I think, Mr. Bilker, that covers it as succinctly as I can. Thank you, Mark. Thank Before you. I turn it over to public comment, Mr. Ciano is shooting daggers at me. Nick Ciano also went to Marple Newtown. <laughs> it was okay. I was going to let it slide. <laughs> All right, folks. Public comments now open. Um, welcome you to take, uh, stand and approach the microphone. If you would please turn it on so that it's green. Sure. And uh, just give us your name and where you live. And My name is Michelle Graham. I live in Broomall. I have two kids at Russell. And I really appreciate, Mr. Bilker, everything you said in support of the teachers. Uh, I'm wondering why then you're not just accepting their proposed contract. That's not a responsible form of governance, ma'am. We've got obligations to the district to enter into a responsible contract. Okay. Okay. We believe that we have proposed something that is responsible, but that also achieves those objectives. The union disagrees. I'm, I'm sure you're aware, and I disagree as well. I want some clarification on something. It's my understanding that you currently have a surplus of $17 million. Is that correct? I don't know. I don't know what you mean by surplus. A surplus in your in your budget, in your funding, a rainy day fund. Can you address that, Mr. Driscoll? If you're including capital funds. I'm, I'm including what I understand to be a rainy day fund, a surplus in your budget. I don't know what a rainy day fund is supposed to be, but we have a fund balance that has a little over $8 million in it, and we have money earmarked for the capital reserve fund. Okay. What is the capital reserve fund? Capital reserve fund is a fund that has been set up to allow funds to be transferred into at the end of years that accumulate for capital needs. We've okay. paid for the $12 million renovations on the field, the $8 million is happening now at uh, Culbertson. So those, those funds have been seriously drawn down. Okay. That's what they're for. Okay. So there's not a surplus now you're saying, or there's an $8 million surplus? Well, we, we do strive to keep an 8% fund balance, which is about one month worth of spending. Okay. And there's some other, you know, there's funds for capital. Okay. It's, it's my understanding that comparable districts usually have less than $500,000 in their surplus or rainy day fund. Is that accurate or not accurate? I wouldn't be able to tell you that, but I know that there are districts that have quite quite a bit of fund balance. Okay. And so you're unable to use that surplus to pay the teachers? Well, so, and again, maybe Joe would be a better person to answer this, but it's one-time money, right? It's not built into the budget. Yeah, I mean, the best way to look at it is probably your savings account, if you would. And the more you draw down your savings for reoccurring expenses, it's sooner or later it's going to run out. Sure. You have to build. It's about building in reoccurring revenues to match reoccurring expenses. <coughs> That's why those one-time sources of funds are ideal for capital and the purchase of one-time items okay. because they're not reoccurring. It's right. not to say a board couldn't say, look, we, we need another half a million dollars to close the budget gap this year. Over because we don't have enough taxing authority to type to hit into the fund balance a little bit. This board has done it in the past, not maybe this exact nine, um, but it's not ideal because you can run into deficits if you rely on it too much for too long. Sure. What is what is that? I'm sorry. Yeah. No. Um, what what does that mean when you say run into deficits? Well, if you if you fail to, I'm going to just talk about taxes. If you fail to increase taxes because it's the one revenue everybody knows about. Mm -hmm. If you fail to keep your revenue, keep up with your expenditures, eventually your expenditures will grow past your revenues and you won't, you'll have a fund deficit, meaning you're bringing in less money than you're spending. That's all. When you're running, though, these surpluses in the millions ev almost every single year, so I'm just looking at 2022 over 2 million, 2021 over 6 million, does that tell you that then you do have money in the budget to spend on important things? Well, it, what it tells you is, is that in those particular years, there may be one-time items that happen. There could be systemic changes that happened. And like we have, you could have one large property sell that brings in $2 million. But it okay. doesn't happen every year. It, it does, though, happen most years. Is that correct? Well, you do get a fair positive variance in most years, yes, because it's much better than the alternative. Sure. Uh, yeah, I, I definitely understand that. I guess my concern and my question is is that to me, as a taxpayer, nothing is more important than ensuring that our teachers are fairly compensated. So when I see a surplus like this every single year, and it's not comparable, so I have done the research comparable to other districts, you are running a surplus that is far greater than neighboring districts. I'm wondering why we're not using those funds to buy into our teachers, which are more important, I think, than anything else you guys are spending money on, although we appreciate all of the things that are happening in Marple. We love the fields. We love the schools. I don't think they're going to make a difference if we don't have teachers in the classroom teaching our children. 
Thank you. Thank you. There's a lot of familiar faces here. Good evening. I'm Debbie Peters, and I'm a proud Marble resident. I've lived in the district for 37 years. I'm the mother of two Marble graduates and a retired former teacher of Marble Newtown who served the district for close to 20 years. I think I have a pretty good perspective on the district. Um, and so I wanted, first of all, to say thank you for everything that you've done. I've been really pretty proud of what, what this district has done. Um, during COVID and everything else, I really pretty good. But now I, I'd like to sh share some remarks about um, what's going on. I'm really concerned about the trajectory that the district is taking. As a former employee who has participated on the negotiations team for previous contracts, I know firsthand the difficult task in which you're engaged. Marple Newtown currently finds itself at a crossroads. Following a collection of contracts for, that provided for its teachers, while also carefully keeping them pinned down through complex pay freezes or step freezes, adding money to the schedule, but asking everybody to move back a step and other tactics, I've had the unfortunate task of going back to members of the union after contract negotiations and saying, this is probably the best we're going to get. But that was during a time when the tax base was comprised of senior citizens, many of whom were on fixed income and something the school board definitely had to consider. Today, as you've already said, Mr. Bilker, that scenario has changed. And in the past, taxpayers came before the board and asked that their tax taxes be raised in order to keep the district on a positive path forward to benefit the students, as well as the homeowner's property values. Today, that likely isn't necessary. The neighborhoods are turning over with more young families settling here, and new developments are popping up, coupled with impressive numbers of new businesses, corporations, and retail establishments. Marple Newtown has had a 47% increase in tax revenue since 2013, with more construction underway. If you haven't experienced it yourself, you know, try going down Westchester Pike at certain times mm -hmm. of day when they're <laughs> moving those things around, and you're going, oh, wow, there's still mm -hmm. more building. So there will be an influx of even more tax revenue. So the tax revenue base has changed, and that change should benefit Marple Newtown. Today it's not about having enough revenue. It's about how the tax revenue is allocated. So where is the revenue going? A defensible budget balances that need for new equipment technology, building improvements, and salaries for teachers and staff. When the last contract was signed, Marple only allocated 17.4% of the budget on teacher salaries, while other districts in the area, as you know, reached as high as 20.7% at Ridley, 26.2% at Garnet Valley, 23% at Springfield, Rose Tree Media, and Haverford. What does that communicate to our teachers? The district, I don't think they're saving for a rainy day, because if so, today is that rainy day. You continually have excess in your budget, and new facilities are wonderful. And putting new equipment and technology in the hands of our students is imperative. And those are real needs that the district has struggled with in the past, and you've looked at those costs and benefits and made the choices that were best for the students in Markle Newtown. But with teacher shortages hitting the nation as a whole, including Pennsylvania in particular, the district is now faced with a reckoning. Your teachers are leaving. This is what really frightens me. Not just retirees, but the best and brightest teachers in the district because what you're offering is not the best that they can get. They're in demand, and they are valued. And if you can't see it, other districts will, and they're going to compensate the teachers fairly. These are veteran teachers many of whom stuck it out during COVID. Quality, experienced teachers who are integral to keeping Marple Newtown synonymous with excellence, and you're flirting with a mass exodus. You've already witnessed this at the beginning of the year, and at this point, the thought of having teachers go out on strike for a few days shouldn't be a concern. What should be a concern is the number of teachers who will be leaving the district permanently. 
According to a recent poll, 83% of your elementary teachers responded that they would be seeking employment elsewhere if a favorable contract isn't reached. That's a situation that requires immediate attention. Marple Newtown is hemorrhaging and a Band-Aid fix over a few years just isn't going to cut it. I've read that your last offer, you wanted to bring back bump steps. Years ago, the bump steps were removed to help teachers maximize their career earnings and to add them back in as a quick fix. The skies with loyalty steps isn't really setting the district up for a long-term success, but rather inviting more of the same problems that you've had in the past. And I understand that just yesterday, you emailed the entire union stating that your most recent offer was your best and final offer. Really? Your current contract hasn't even expired. You're three months into your mandatory negotiation period, and you've reached your final offer? It would seem way too early to draw that line in the sand. I'm pretty much encouraging teachers to send out their resumes because they might not have anything to lose. If it's a scare tactic, I don't think it's having a desired effect. As a teacher, it's obvious. If you want to be ev valued appropriately, Marple Newtown isn't may not be, I won't say isn't, but may not be at present the district for you. In my discussions with current teachers, it's apparent that morale across the district is at an all-time low. However, you'd never see it in the way that they interact with the students. They're consummate professionals who love what they do, but if you talk to them honestly, you'll hear. They don't feel valued because the district is continuing to show that they aren't. They deserve a contract that appropriately recognizes their continued contribution to the community, and when they see that opportunity elsewhere, you can't be surprised if they pursue it. How can we, as taxpaying community members, make this more clear? You are already recognizing this. You need to course correct. Dragging your feet and eventually getting our district's pay, split, pay scale comparable to other districts will lead to Marple Newtown eventually being left with a slew of inexperienced teachers. You ask any teacher to name someone who has furthered and helped them with their career, I guarantee they'll name another veteran teacher. Yet what veteran would want to stay somewhere with the hope that eventually they'll be valued? These same veteran teachers assumed they would eventually get their steps back or at least have earned enough through competitive salary increases to make up for those losses. What does it say about this district's loyalty to them when a new hire is placed at step 10, five years beyond their earned step, and those who have been here 12 plus years may be as low as step eight? It says you recognize the current demand for high quality teachers, the limited avail availability of candidates, and that you're willing to pay accordingly. And I commend you for that. Bravo. But now you need to extend that same recognition to the rest of the teachers in the district. Surely you have to understand that by that very act, by that very type of hiring, is a monumental slap in the face to those teachers who stayed with the district through the pay freeze after pay freeze. Perhaps they should resign and apply to be rehired so that they'll be valued appropriately. Now is the time to acknowledge and reconcile the career losses those teachers endured and continue to endure. It's time to look at teachers with a different cost benefit than you do a cinder block or a laptop. Think about it this way. It's about heart and mind. Teachers aren't a commodity. They are a resource. They teach with heart. Their love is the students whose lives they touch and whose minds they open, whose imaginations they encourage. Teachers didn't choose their careers because they would make a lot of money. Ask any teacher, and I guarantee you, not one entered the field because of their excellent earning potential. But they did expect to make an honest living. The riches they reap are in the students they teach. Invest in our students' future. Invest in their teachers. You have the dollars. It's time to do the right thing and decide with your hearts. Thank you. Thank you.
Excuse me. Can I, can I comment on, um, before you start, sure. on the bump steps? So well, I'm fairly new at this, and I was curious about that. And, um, I'd ask Mr. Orwig to, to get some information from surrounding districts. Um, and I have here at least four from Radnor, Haverford, Springfield, and Wallingford, Swarthmore, that all, it's not un uncommon to have bump steps in the salary schedules. Basically, to me, it's a, it's a significant increase on the higher end of the salary scale, which, which does address the people that have been here the longest. So I don't know, you know what else that means, but that's, yeah. it's not an uncommon practice. If, if I could respond, Mr. Sure. Desi, I think the concern there is when you weight the bumps at step 16 or higher, those are individuals that are going to stay anyway. What we want to do is make sure that teachers are retained and come through our district. Um, so when I look at those groups that have bumps, I'm still seeing starting salaries, uh, three to five thousand dollars less. Max salaries, seven to sixteen thousand dollars less. The freeze is causing career income losses of forty to one hundred fifty thousand um, dollars. You can't expect people to stay if they're not going to be compensated fairly to their peers. And the way you look at your peers is by surrounding districts. I'm not talking about private schools or or places on the main line that are that are that that they're astronomical have astronomical taxes. I'm talking about places like Haverford and Springfield, Rose Tree Media. New teacher certifications have dropped 70 percent in the past decade, 25,000 to 7,600 annually. Um, when you're <laughs> in in business, and I'm not a teacher, I, I'm in business. Um, that means that demand is high, and you have to pay accordingly for those teachers to keep them. If you don't keep them, we all know that high-performing schools start to suffer, test scores start to suffer, which ultimately makes Marple Newtown a less desirable place to live, which lowers demand for houses, which reduces business, which drops property values, and negatively impacts the financial outlooks of all residents. You don't have to have a student in the district to understand the value of having well-paid teachers that stay and, and teach our children. The, we've talked about, about opinions and we've talked about facts. Um, when you look at the public audit reports, these, <coughs> just because they're being shared by folks on social media and, and, and by hand does not mean that they're not true. The overages are true. Two million, over $2 million in 2022, over $6 million in 2022. When you look at the percentage of the overrun that in the instructional budget versus actuals, you have numbers in the 20% to 40% that are directly caused to, to being under budget in instructional budget. That's money that was going to go to the teachers that for one reason or another, we don't have that information, has not gone to them. Ultimately, at the end of the day, what we're talking about is, is surpluses going back to the teachers that need them, right? Uh, in to, here's another number in total. So if you look at the budgets, and we are given limited information as residents, there's overage to the fund and there's transfers out. If you total overages to the fund as well as transfers out, which remember are, as far as we see on the budgets, are not part of any budgeted items in that calendar year, you look at from 2010 to 2022, a total of overage of $55,776,332 in the past years. When you're looking at contract negotiations and the difference is in, is, is, is one million, or 500,000 between the two fixes, or two million. That's a fraction to keep our teachers here. Let's talk again. One last thing I'll close with. Let's say that the board decides, no, we need every single cent of that surplus money. What's that gonna cost taxpayers? If the union's proposal is $2 million, which would be above, below uh, a, a traditional union proposal of this size, and historically, what we've learned in our own research of $3 million, it, it, it equates to pennies a day. Let's say you have a house that's worth $500,000. Your taxes could be increased if not a penny goes from the surplus uh, of $60 a year. That's less than $5 a month. Take my Netflix subscription so that we can pay our teachers. Thank you. Next. Next. Uh, before, just thank, thank you for your comment. Just, I, I, and I, there was obviously a lot of subjects covered there, and I just wanted to, to touch on one. It was, and it's a, it's not, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't need to expect you to come back up and debate it because we said that's not what we're, okay. that's not what we do. You can talk about it later if you want. But, um, but one of the things you talked about was, you talked about the starting salary and the max salary, right? So 
And we talked about that too. We want to address those things. If you want to address the max salary, how do you do it? Okay, that's uh, uh, how, how do you do it? If you want to make a max salary competitive with the school districts that Dave mentioned or the school districts in the in the surrounding area, how do you do it? That's all. That's, uh, we'll we'll get to it. I just it's things that I want you know as you guys are talking in the community. Yeah, yeah, no. Please. Yeah, no, I. <laughs> all right. <laughs> I appreciate the. The, the point, right? Because if it, max salary is important for retention, but this is not an isolated incident. We're talking about years of freezes and years of, to your own, to the, to the board's own points, um, overly conservative teacher spending. So we are. I so agree. What, what I agree. We, right. I mean, we I, 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 I don't know about oh, but very conservative teacher spending for decades. That yeah. is that is accurate, and we are here. Uh, after, like I said, I, know, right. I didn't mean to interrupt you, by the way. No, you know, no, no, of course, um, of course, no. Um, we're here because all of a sudden, and this is, all of a sudden, this is uh, the past year, you know, Lower Marion opens up a new middle school and people are flying all around. And, lower, you know, again, we've talked about this before, but Lower Marion's just an outlier in yeah. everything. I think everybody will pretty much acknowledge that. Um, yeah. So there's a, like I said, there's a lot of points that you guys are making and we're not saying you're wrong. Of course, yeah. It's 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 a difficult it's a difficult situation. We want to we want to we want to fix it or, or get it right tracked. Okay, I, that's I, all I wanted to point out. And, and I sincerely hope that the sentiment that you're projecting to the board is is happening at the negotiation table. So thank you so much for your time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hi, as I said earlier, I'm Justine Lehigh. I am a resident of Marble Township. I have three daughters, two of which are at Russell Elementary School. Um, one who will be in kindergarten, I think it's the, feels like forever from now, but 24, 25 school year maybe, perhaps. Um, and just to touch on that kind of lightly, knowing that I have a few years before my youngest reaches Russell, Thinking about the fact that she might not have the teachers that we love so much right now. I mean, I'm standing here in my most vulnerable state telling you how sad that makes me. So sad. Um, just commenting on your very conservative teacher spending in the past, and it's decades and decades that we have to fix. You have the ability to be that change. You have it. Not you specifically. You all have the ability to make that change. Um, I did want to also comment directly about the bump steps. Um, I've learned a lot about bump steps over the past 24 hours, I feel like, because it was something I hadn't heard of before. Um, but at one of the last meetings, it was stated by the board that they did not want to pay one group of staff more than another, that they wanted it to be fair across the board. I'll tell the community that a bump step is not fair. It is not fair across the board. It is taking one portion of teachers and giving them more money than the rest. That's what a bump step is. It's a Band-Aid over a large wound. Um, so I knew I wanted to get up here tonight, but with so much to say, I really didn't know where to start. Um, but I did want to quote some things that I um, read directly from teachers who do not teach in our district, but have heard what's going on in Marple Newtown. Um, to quote, when I was looking for teaching jobs, Marple was significantly less than other districts. Like laughable, laughable is what this person said. Where I teach, all of our new staff are from Marple. I reached out to this person, because um, I did want some clarification, and she did clarify. Not all of our new staff are from Marple, but it feels like every time we have a new hire and we find out where they're from, they say, Marple. They're leaving Marple to come to other districts, which I think we've all heard speculation, but it, it's happening. Um, another comment that I saw that was completely unsolicited by anyone here in this room um, was from someone who lives in a neighboring district who does not teach in our district and said, as a teacher in the next district over, thank you. I've heard what is happening to Marble Newtown teachers right now and it's terrible. What that means is that teachers in other districts are aware of what is happening. The community is aware of what is happening. And I'm here not to tell you guys because you guys know what's happening. But I don't think the community does, and they need to hear it. Um, so from the perspective of a parent, 
my biggest question to you guys is this. If you, clearly we're already starting to be known as a district that does not pay well. The word is out. We don't pay our teachers well. How are you envisioning this district being able to hire and keep good teachers? If it's already out there that we can't do it, we're not going to get those teachers. We're not going to get them. We stand up here raising our concerns, and we're not doing so out of speculation. This is real life. This is happening. We're not speculating that these things might happen if things don't go this way. It's already happening. Um, our teachers are leaving, and they're going to continue to leave for other districts where they feel valued and appreciated and where they will receive fair pay. I've spoken to teachers. I've spoken to the community members. I'm not just coming up here to say this, just to say it. This is life. Um, you say we can't afford to raise their salaries, but what we as a community actually can't afford is to lose the quality education for our children that we are choosing to raise in this community. It is a choice. We also have the choice to leave and go to other districts where we know that the township cares for the teachers. If we need to pay competitive salaries to new hires, how in the long run is that more financially responsible than paying the teachers we currently have? If we have to pay and we say we're going to pay this exorbitant amount of money to get these highly qualified teachers, in the long run, that's going to cost us so much more than just giving the teachers what they deserve now. Let's keep the teachers that we already have. From the perspective of an educator, I'm also a special education teacher. I'm not just a parent in the community. I have a master's plus 30. I have 15 years of teaching experience in the field of special education. After everything I've seen and heard over the past few months, if you've asked me if I wanted to work for Marple Newtown, no, I don't. Um, we hear your words, I hear your words, we hear your words, now it's time to show the community and our teachers that you mean them. It sounds cliche, but if you're going to talk the talk, you've got to walk the walk. Otherwise, the teachers, they're out of here. Thank you, man. Hi, everyone. My name is Jim O'Shea. I'm a parent of a second grader at Culbertson. Um, thank you for everything that you do, everyone's time. Um, I really do. Um, I'm here also to advocate for the teachers, as an advocate for the teachers. Um, uh, we prepare our students to become responsible citizens, independent learners with the attitude, desire, skills, and abilities necessary to become successful lifelong learners. We provide a safe, nurturing, yet highly academic learning environment which is centered at the individual needs of the students, directed by teachers, and supported by parents in the community. That's Colbertson's mission. I'm here because I want that mission to continue. It seems every other week I hear about a teacher leaving or an assistant teacher leaving. Um, a couple weeks ago, one of the teacher's uh, assistants left. Uh, she'd been there for a while. Um, uh, I, my, can I say names? Is that acceptable? <laughs> the teacher was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Miss Kearney, uh, Meg Kearney, she's sweet. Um, I was very sad for her to leave. But I'm also happy for her. Um, I heard she went to uh, Lower Marion School District. That's where everyone seems to be going, um, right? How many teachers, teachers assistants, have we lost to Lower Marion? Um, I heard that her salary basically was doubled. Um, Everything you're saying, I'm appreciate. Just we have no ability whatsoever to catch Lower Marion salaries. And yeah. the teachers know that. And I, I know they they're know. expecting to catch oh, Lower Justine, Marion. Justine, I'm sorry, I Justine. But just, I, that's the other thing. I, I'm just saying it because he, yeah. he brought it up. There. I I don't expect, or I don't know what the. I'm not a teacher, like I said. I'm a parent. I don't know what 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 they think would be acceptable, but I, I was looking online and I saw that a posting for a full-time permanent special education teacher with an associate's degree, $19,000.
I know it's a teaching oh. assistant for Miss Kearney's position. That's what three hundred eighty dollars a week, give or take. After taxes, retirement benefits. What's what's that leave you? You know that that couldn't cover my food bill a week for my family. That this is ridiculous at this point. You guys are losing great people. Um, a little bit before that, you guys lost uh, Colleen Reardon. Went to the same place. Before that, you guys lost Christina Callahan. Awesome teacher. She set the bar so high, and we didn't we didn't keep her. We lost her. He also went to the same school district. All these teachers are going to that school district. Like I said, I don't expect you to, you know, get into some game. We're going to match them. We're going to do this. But you guys have to compensate them fairly. Um, I, I just I just don't understand the starting salaries. Um, young lady back there mentioned the budget uh, was 17.4 percent for uh, teachers. Currently, is that correct? Yeah. I'm sorry. Can can someone comment if that's approximately correct? The percent of our budget that goes to teachers. Uh, to get that specific number. Well, are you talking classroom teachers or the entire union? All of them, like teachers, teachers' aid, PTs, OTs, speech. Oh, that's, if you're talking support. about just teachers' union, it's over $24 million. Probably $24.5 million. Well, we have about a $101 million budget, so it's about 24%. I don't know, I'm not going to say that number's incorrect because I don't know what it's based on because, you know, it could be a piece of that. I don't want to get into that debate. I have not been given the data to, to where that came from to verify it. Sure. It looks like it was 17.4, 17.5% of that in, in the past. I don't know what the yeah, correct number you would know, sir. I, I, I don't know yeah. what that's yeah. based on. I mean, the teachers union is made up of more than teachers. Yeah. There's a lot of professional positions in that group. There's nurses, guides. I'm not saying some you guys don't know, but if you take that whole pie, it's a little over 24 and a half million. It's like 24.56 percent of the total budget, I believe. Okay. In that neighborhood. I mean, I'd like to have the data in front of me, but that's, you know, the 17 percent number. I'd, I'd need to see what made that up to say if it's correct or not. I don't want to say that it's not. It's very mild way. Could be. Well, no, when I say that's the teachers, so that's their group, but if you get into other groups, there's teachers' assistants, that's a whole other group. Gotcha. So that's not included in the point. No. No, 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 no. It looks like, um, in, in, I, I had read something, and I, you guys would know, um, in the last few years, you've lost over 50 teachers. Is that correct? I would say there was something around 35 plus in the last year, but. That's just the last year. I mean, yeah, last but I, just, to cl just to clarify oh, sorry, sir. that this is the teacher uh, movement is not just a Marple situation. This is we're coming off of the pandemic. They're, yeah. they're moving everywhere um, and not saying we don't need to fix this situation. But by throwing out a number saying we lo we're losing 50 teachers, it seems like we're over here just not doing our due diligence. This is a nationwide issue with teachers jumping. Yeah. I know, but I'm here just talking about Marple and because my... Yeah, but I'm letting you know that that issue yeah. isn't just from us. This is sure. a nationwide issue as well. Oh, I know. I know everyone's... Um, yeah, no, 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 no. Um, like I said, I, I just... Every, like I said, every other week, someone's leaving, um, and I just want that to stop, you know? Especially the children in, you know, special education, our autistic support... They get used to these teachers. Um, you know, you have awesome teachers, uh, awesome support staff, you know, the teaching assistants. Um, Mrs. Cox is great. Mr. K, Ms. Eversall is awesome. You know, I don't, I don't want to lose these people, you know. And I, I, like I said, when I heard she left and basically doubled her salary, it's just, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm sad to see her go, but I'm happy for her. Thank you for your time, everybody.
members of the community, school board, solicitor, employees of the district. Um, I was up here last month um, voicing my support for the teachers. Um, and there's been some things that have transpired since that time that have come to the attention of the public. Um, and I'll premise my comments this evening by saying everybody wants to win here, right? Everybody. It's a win. It's a football team on a Friday night winning, right? The team environment is what this comes down to. I don't think anybody here wants to put the proverbial screws to anybody. So the following, I'll premise on solicitor's comments earlier. Um, these are my opinions. And for defamation, <laughs> um, you're not using the New York Times versus Sullivan standard for public officials to prove actual malice tonight, are we? Because I assure you, none of, none of that. I, 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 can't, I can't speak for anybody but myself. I don't think there's anybody up here with ill will towards any of you sitting behind the tables this evening. Um, you work for the school, but you ultimately work for, let's break it down to the smallest common denominator, our children, right? So you're in a collective bargaining agreement. <clears throat> National Labor Relations Board talks about good faith, right? I don't see, um, personally, my opinion, the good faith in sending out a final proposal to the teachers, to all of the teachers. I understand that that tactic has, has some good benefit and bad benefit, you want the teachers to see what your position is. The bad part about it is it undermines the negotiator's position. And that is a standard under the National Labor Review Board. And the reason I'm qualifying that is because I know a lot of the teachers were going after their union leadership. What are you doing? Why are you doing it? Why is this? You're messing up. What are you letting these people do? That in and of itself, I think, was a mistake, my opinion, right? Those negotiators are tasked with negotiating a contract. When you tell all the teachers what you're trying to do, during a negotiation, that undermines, in my opinion, their authority, right? They're trying to advocate on behalf of their members. I know it wasn't to try. I, don't, I know you, Matt, a little bit. I don't think it was done in bad faith. But that was the ramification of what happened, and you guys should know about that. The union leadership should not be questioned, the, the negotiators should not be questioned during the contractual negotiation period. I see you're looking at your watch, and I'm probably on a three minute no, no, clock. No, 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 no. no, it's it's fine. I know under the Sunshine Act, I get three minutes. And I appreciate it, <laughs> perhaps. Yeah, I, That's why we all have. Yeah, my wife tells me I have a tendency to do that to people, so. Um, so no, there's, there's no, there's no malice in my heart up here towards any of you at all. Um, if there's a tone that's not appropriate tonight, I think is very uh, solemn, very emotional. Um, if you don't like some of our tone speaking, you guys follow the Roberts rules of order, I'm presuming so. Maybe a board member, or faculty, staff, could bring it to the attention of the chair just so the chair can acknowledge that that conduct might not be inappropriate. Because last month for being in attendance, I didn't see anybody calling anybody derogatory names. If people made a statement about a certain someone in specific making a certain salary, that's public knowledge, right? There wasn't, just as a comparison to talk about percentages, I think the, the kind lady that made the presentation was talking about percentages and raises. And in no way, sir, should that have um, been taken personally. If you did, I apologize. I didn't make the point, but I'm sensitive to what you know, people make. You work an honest day's, um, you work an honest day, you get paid an honest wage. That's what we're here for. Um, I want to correct the record last month. I said I don't care about hazardous pay. I said it in jest. Um, I was not aware the union was negotiating hazardous pay. I'm kind of surprised someone from the uh, citizenry, someone who's a resident here, spoke about how they don't want hazardous pay, how they don't want taxes to increase, which is their prerogative. But the fact that the individual who, I, I believe the kind lady said she was a real estate agent act, talking on behalf of some clients, I don't know where the kind lady came into the information that the union was asking for hazardous pay, right? 
these negotiations, it was, I mean, it's on the record, it's, on, it's taped. She said it. It was here last month. She said, I don't believe they should get hazardous pay. Here's what I believe. You guys, as administrators and board members, have a school safety drill in effect, correct? You implement it so kids might have to hide under a table. You can say, oh, well, we're safe. There's no gun violence here. Well, right down the streets, the city of Philadelphia, a lot of people are getting shot. In the state of Tennessee yesterday, no one knew a 27-year-old individual with an assault rifle was going to shoot the door open, right? Break into school, kill three, three girls and three teachers. Those girls were nine years old. So the point I'm making about hazardous pay, I care, because if you're having them practice that, you should be paying them for it. It's unpredictable. It's part of it. Now, I can see that with conviction because I was in the military. When we went into a hot theater, your pay went up. Now, it's, uh, I'm just trying to help here. If that's a source of contention to give everybody hazardous duty pay or hazardous pay, why not have the board or the union or the, the board and the union maybe think about having a blanket insurance policy that, God forbid, if that were to happen here, the families are compensated accordingly. So there's so many things that will, they will lose on that day, like yesterday in Tennessee. Lost love, lost lo your child. I can't even speak. Your child not coming home from school because someone who has a mental health problem using a gun maybe they should or should not have had. I'm not getting into that debate. But the fact is, their child isn't coming home from school. Teachers are their shepherds here. They're stewards. They bring them to safety. They should be, if you're not going to compensate for it, put out something where they're going to benefit from it if it should happen. There shouldn't be a GoFundMe page. Well, there should. But the school district should step up and be like, this is horrible. Not just this school district, any school district in America, right? That is horrible, what happened. People can blame what is the most common and sacred thing here and why we are all here is for our kids, right? So if you're going to argue about the pay, think about putting in a blanket policy where the solicitor could look into it maybe, where it would be feasible to have a blanket insurance policy, God forbid something happened, that that family is covered for the rest of their lives, right? That's reasonable. You know, you're up here talking about what is and what is not feasible, percentages of a budget going to certain places for certain reasons, but at the end of the day, those things are important to the people. You know, whatever step you come to, I hope it's, it's logical, but don't, please, 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 let's, let's not talk about, you know, final. Let's keep open doors, open channels. Let's work together. Right? Let's consider that under the law in Pennsylvania, the school code is incorporated into that contract. Let's do di due diligence, take a look at the code, and see what it is we need to put in to protect the needs of the teachers. That is the fundamental interest of democracy, of union negotiations, of school boards, and who we are as a society. Thank you for your time. Hello, I'm Ingrid Tate. I live in uh, Newtown Square. Thank you for your time. Um, now that we know that there is money in the budget, would you say yes to fixing the steps and raising the um, teacher salaries equally across the board, like you mentioned at the last school board meeting? You said you didn't want to do it in different groups. Sorry, it's time for me to go. Um, Ingrid, I don't want to get too deep into okay. our, our proposal. I, I, let me think if there's a way that I can get to this. Um, I believe that there are reasons why we need to make adjustments to a number of different areas to support retention, attraction, and the loyalty of our members. Okay. Um, according to the budget on the Marple News Home website, like we discussed, there's a surplus of 55 million. 14 million wait, of- Wait, wait, wait. Again, I don't mean to interrupt you. Okay. A surplus of 55 million? Went over 12 years, I'm sorry. Thank you. I apologize. Don't, okay, that's okay. I've been trying to take notes and cross out okay. what people have already said. Um, so excuse me. 
uh, so to the best of my knowledge, uh, 14 million of that over the 12 years surplus was instructional budget, which was already um, voted on and allocated for instruction, but were transferred out for some reason. Um, are they still available? And if not, what were they used for? Do you know how to answer that question? Sort of. Um, when a budget year closes, revenues and expenses get they get they get closed out into uh, the net position of the district, right? So the overs and unders. Let me just think how I can. Um, like I'm a fifth grader. No, 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 no. no. Seriously. <laughs> no, I'm trying to. What I'm trying to say is, is, is you know, money is allocated in a specific year. If you don't spend it, it does go over into fund balance. Okay. But the spending, what you're looking, when you're looking at a budget versus actuals, when you're looking at an audit report, for example, you're looking at the results of a budget that probably started two years before that. So obviously the actuals um, vary. You know, we, you, we've been talking about turnover a lot. I'm sure that had a lot to do with it. Um, underspending has a lot to do with it. You, we, we expected to spend X, we only spent Y. So. When, when, a, when an annual budget is done, it's done, it's completed, it's rolled out, it's over, it's in the fund balance, and what the board has been doing has been trying to save the one-time funds when we have them, and it's been pretty consistently um, for, for capital needs and other one-time costs. So it, yes, it's gone, but it's not gone. It was, we, it's it's one-time money allocated somewhere else. Now, any of those variances in a prior year Maybe revenues come in stronger and they're going to stay consistent. Maybe the state gave us a late budget and that revenue is going to stay consistent. It's factored into the next year's budget. So it, we do keep up with all those things. And believe me, the budget isn't just, it's not just let's take this budget from this year and add 4% to it. When you see, we, we budget down to the employee. Like if you said, let me see this employee, we can sh I'll show you their name, salary, all their benefits, and it gets funneled into account. Now, by the time... You see an audit report 24 months later, a lot has happened. I would be the first to tell you that the budget is, n is only as good as the night they approve it. So yes, there have been positive variances, and the board, we've managed those in a way to uh, reinvest back into the infrastructure of the district, because it's significant. The only other way to invest $8 million into Culbertson again, or $12 million in the field, would be to go out and borrow it. And then that actually you know, raises taxes and hits the general operating budget. So the money doesn't disappear, and it's not, in, it's not gone somewhere magical. It's just earmarked for capital, and that's what the board's been spending it on. I don't know right. if I answered that question. It, it, but, but thank you. Thank you for trying. And yes, um, I get what you're saying. But if it's already, I, I don't understand why, if it's already allocated for instruction, why it can't be used for that. So it, it seems to me, and I am not a money person. You can ask my husband. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, that if you simply take the excess instructional money from last year, so we're not going back the 12 years or anything, that was already improved for instruction, um, it could fix the steps for all the teachers and have enough for raises without constraining the district budget. So it's not that we're going to have to raise taxes. The money is there. But we keep hearing that we can't do what the teachers are asking for because of taxes. I don't know if I heard because of taxes, but when the when when you underspend any given category in the budget, um, you know those variances are looked at and they're factored in next year. Because, for instance, this year we're faced with the nine percent increase in medical costs and twenty percent increase on prescription. That's high. Um, so any of those leftover dollars. That budget is rebuilt this year and to exactly what those projections are going to be. If once the money rolls over and becomes one-time funds, call it a savings account, you do need to be careful with how you spend one-time dollars for reoccurring expenses. Because sooner or later, you have to have the reoccurring payments. So if salaries go up $2 million, I think was quoted, and you use $2 million of your reserve, next year it goes up another million, There's another th there's a, that's $3 million. That's not one-time money. You've got to build in revenue in the future to sustain it. You know, yes, you could use a little bit of that money to kind of offset and help bridge to build that revenue, so you may not tax 
you know, 100% in year one and year two, but sooner or later you have to build structurally into your budget revenues to support those ongoing costs because they don't go away. It's not giving $3 million in someone's salary and it goes back $3 million next year. It stays there and grows. You see, I understand what you're saying, but it just seems to us that we have an awful lot in ours compared to other districts. I, also I'm not spend seeing a lot that, more on their teachers. But I, you know, I, I know that there was, you know, a study by the state a long time ago that had not a long time ago, a few years ago that had the list of everyone's fund balances in the state, and we weren't that high. But you also have to remember when you look at those financial statements, you got to be careful if you watch the timing. So, if you looked at our total fund balance the way it's reported, and we were in the middle, and we were starting Culbertson and Loomis. It might look like we have $50 million more dollars or $40 million more dollars in our fund balance because that money we borrowed to do those projects sits in that net position and gets drawn down on over the years. Just like the Capital Reserve Fund, at one point it was at $21 million. We've drawn it down this year to three because of the Fields Project and, and Culbertson. Now we'll probably put some more back in there so we, you know, because we have other projects that the district needs. I'm not saying that you know, a balance of priorities is an easy task, but there is a balance that the, we have to address building needs, we have to address salaries, we have to address benefits. There's a lot that has to be addressed. And we have a financial responsibility to, to keep a certain level of, of equity. It, it helps our borrowing costs. We have a high credit rating in the district. You know, so there are just certain things that keeping fund balance is good financial practice. I, I do want to jump on one other point, and this is just factual, and that is that you know when we're talking about taxation, this isn't you know it's not like it's not not intended as like a looming threat. We have raised taxes last year, and I think the year before, and the year like we this is not like you know we haven't strung together ten zero percent increases in the row, and then are saying the sky's falling. We, ha we have been raising taxes because of whatever the situation we were in that particular year. It's not something that any elected officials like love to do, but we have done it. So I just wanted to, you know, as we're saying, like, you know, you, there's a suggestion you don't have to raise taxes this year to balance to, to, to do this. Um, I don't think that's going to be true. Um, so my concern is that because our teachers have been so far behind sur in, uh, surrounding districts as far as contracts and salaries go, if we can't get out of the hole we're in, um, our teachers will go to these surrounding districts to get what they are entitled to and feel appreciated. Um, this will be at the detriment of our students' education. And yes, we can hire new teachers at cheaper rate. And believe me, I'm all for getting rid of ineffective teachers and making room for young teachers with new ideas and excitement to make a difference. However, we cannot have all new teachers at once without having veteran teachers around to guide them, which is what's your point as well. Um, teachers, I believe is still the case, have to work for three years in order to receive a permanent cer certification and become highly qualified. There are characteristics that make great educators um, that you cannot teach in college. We have many teachers with these characteristics. We need these teachers to stay because we don't know what we will get with the dwindling population of people seeking their uh, teacher certifications. There is a reason you have to work for a few years to get tenure. We need to agree on a fair contract to keep our creative, exciting, organized, compassionate, effective teachers because we cannot keep trying to throw emergency certification at people and expecting them to know how to handle a classroom full of kids and be effective when they are not well trained and educated themselves. And next year we're starting with block scheduling. So we're going to have block scheduling and a bunch of new teachers. It's my understanding that the union negotiators have proposed a fair agreement that will not have a negative effect on the district budget or taxes. You disagree, and I understand that, but I already wrote this. <laughs> <laughs> it is my belief that we need to accept it unless we, can, uh, unless we have little concern for the education and future of our students. 
Thank you for your time. You're welcome. So, so just to, to, to note, and to accomplish what we have offered, we need to raise taxes. We need to raise taxes this year. It's our goal to try to keep it at or under what we did last year, but to accomplish what we've offered, we, we are going to need to do that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the dialogue, too. Right. Good evening, board and Dr. Kane. Um, my name is Allie Kelly, and I'm a resident of Marple Township. I wish I would have gone first. Um, I am not a linguist, and there are some really fantastic comments to follow up. I was kind of considering not going up at all, but um, I thought I might as well. Um, anyway, I came to my first Marple Newtown School Board meeting a month ago, and in support of our wonderful teachers, I shared that the district I teach in, with Thacton, was in a very similar situation as Marple Newtown, where we were losing a high number of teachers due to districts that are paying ten to $15,000 higher. This December, as I mentioned before, my district amended the contract two years before it was up, and we finally saw a decline in teachers leaving due to our significant salary increase. And um, to um, the nice man who spoke from Culbertson with his second grade son, um, some, and I know um, Nick just said that teacher movement um, is a problem all throughout the country and throughout the state, but they don't have those problems in the better paid school districts. Ooh, excuse me. Um, Anyway, um, then I was one of the few members of the public who came to the committee meeting on March 14th. Um, I think we had five people here, maybe. Um, all the attendees that night were strongly in support of increasing Marple Newtown teachers' salaries. Although there weren't many of us present, we had a lot of back and forth conversations with the board members. It was really nice to hear the dialogue. I left that night and I also changed, I had the feeling, but I changed it to opinion, um, <laughs> that the board was truly listening to our concerns and what we said wasn't falling on deaf ears. Also, um, with some of the board's responses, I was able to see again, in my opinion, that the board does care about our district. Sometimes it is forgotten that they do volunteer all their time. Um, they don't get paid. They do this for free. So I did mention at the March 14th meeting that I've been through many contract negotiations at my, with my 20 years at Methacton. I also mentioned that I have been through one strike. As we all know, teacher strikes put an enormous strain on everyone involved, and I would hate to see it get to that point here. So this is where we could really make that change. There are a lot of smart people on both sides of the table dealing with these contract negotiations, and there are a lot of very good idea. It is my hope that the board will be as open to discussing with the MNEA as they were with us on March 14th. I hope the board listens to the teachers' proposals and together can come up with a solution to ensure that Marple Newtown continues to be a wonderful school district for our children. Thank you. Hey, this is Michelle Graham again. I have a follow-up question. Did you present your best and final offer? Okay, so I have another question for you. Have you guys polled the residents about um, their priorities for the budget and their interest in a possible tax increase? Yeah, so you're here for the stakeholders. So I keep hearing you say that, and in my opinion, I do feel like it's a scare tactic to talk about raising taxes we, constantly throughout this. That is my opinion only. But I, for one, would not mind my taxes being raised. That's a different thing, though, right? And, that, and that's OK. Yeah. But what, uh, it's not a scare tactic. We are looking at a tax raise. I guess we need more information then about the budget, because based on our research, okay. which is limited, because you offer limited information, we don't feel that there would need to be a tax increase. But we are absolutely aware that we don't have all of the information in the budget, because you don't share it. So we have asked Mr. Driscoll directly for information regarding the budget that he has not shared or responded to. Is that so, true? What information have you asked for about the budget? Justine Lehigh and I have both emailed you repeatedly. For the, for the, for the board minutes? For many for things, Mr. Driscoll. The funds, for the budget. breakdown of the general funds. <laughs> the breakdown of the general funds is the budget. The budget's on the website. The general fund... General funds is, a, is an interesting term. It's, an, it's, it's fund accounting. General fund is the fund of the district. It's, it's, it's not something we make up or call something. It is the $100 million uh, group of accounts that tracks the ins and outs of all the revenue and expenses in the district. It's, what pay, it's where the teachers are paid from. It's where I'm paid from. It's where supplies are paid from. The general fund is the main operating fund of the district. 
Okay. Just so you know, I mean, because sure. when you say general funds, it sounds like some miscellaneous account. You know, I just want to make sure that everybody understands that general fund is the core of right. the school district budget. I guess what we're wondering is why with these overages year to year, there is not the money to pay our teachers fairly. That's, I think, the main point that we are struggling to understand as community members. And I would love a detailed proposition or feedback from you as to why you are operating with such a large overage every single year when we are hemorrhaging teachers to neighboring districts while you make more than any other business manager in the state of Pennsylvania. That's a fact. That's not an opinion. Is that inaccurate? I don't know that. That's a fact. There's 500, There's 500. You're making the most. The but there's teachers, no reason to yell. Um, Honestly, there's really no reason to yell. I guess I'm, I'm pretty I'm furious. Sure. I, I apologize for my tone and I apologize for no yelling. I guess it feels very disingenuous to hear that you are very concerned with the budget when you have a business manager who is making more than any other business manager in the state who will not respond to his constituents who have questions about the budget. There's, there's no response at all. So that does feel really upsetting. And I, I want you to make every penny that you make. I don't care what you make. I care that you are not passing those money that fair wage along to everyone else on your staff. He also doesn't pass it over. We vote on that. Right, but so is he not in charge of... But I'm just saying, you're mad at the wrong guy. I honestly think you guy. attribute more power to me than I yeah, actually you're, have. Yeah, you're really mad at the wrong guy. Oh, oh so then tell me. I'm just saying. I don't, I'm just saying. Let I'm me ask you, who, who's guy. responsible for the administration the making so much more so than the teachers? Of, all nine of us make these votes. So Why? you can continue to yell at us if you want, but there's no reason to yell at that nice man over there. I, I'm not yelling, and I, I don't dispute He's that like you're a nice man. I'm sure that you are. I guess I'm frustrated because this nice man is not responding to his constituents, and he is making more than any other business manager in the state while the board sits before us and tells us that they don't have the money to pay our teachers barely without raising taxes. To me, that feels disingenuous. That's my opinion, and I'd love for you guys to respond on that. Uh, just, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. Just a, a point of um, clarification, if I may. Um, in regard to the kind lady's comment, um, perhaps the solicitor could um, help in the situation where you have an instance where citizenry is asking members of the uh, school board staff for information. Perhaps the solicitor could come forward with something that's permissible under the NLRB because that's one of the requirements is to provide the unions, or in this case, the, the for the under the collective bargaining agreement to provide them with relevant information that they ask. I know you're, you're, you're a citizen, correct? Correct. That's a great thing to be. Um, <laughs> absolutely. But for some of the, uh, the union folks that want that information, um, it's permissible to ask for it, right? But to provide for it, if, the, if, they need, if you need direction, perhaps you could uh, consult the solicitor, because it should all be transparent and open book if, if, if the solicitor concurs with my assessment. You, you can answer. Yeah. I'm not, I'm just saying. Okay. Just like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, as, I've, uh, <laughs> as I've mentioned before, although I'm the main lawyer for the district, there are two areas I do not handle. One is special education, the other is labor negotiations. So the district has special counsel for labor negotiations, so I am, I am not qualified to speak to what information that the labor, uh, the union leadership is entitled to. So that would be something that would, uh, if the board would like an answer, would have to ask its labor counsel. But I can speak to what members of the public are entitled to. And, that, and I have mentioned this before to, uh, to some members of our community. I mentioned one law, the, the Sunshine Act. The other law is the right to know law. It's really not a uh, aptly named law. It's, it's deceptively titled because it really doesn't give us members of the public the right to know everything. All it does is give us the right to make a request for public records of the district. And public records could include financial records, but there are also a whole bunch of exceptions or exemptions for what is considered to be a public record. So if any member of the public wants to obtain a financial record of the district, all it needs to do is follow the, the, the process under the right to know law. And that's uh, up on our website, and there's a form you fill out and there's a process you go through, and if you're entitled to the public record, you'll receive it. If the district uh, believes you're not, then there's an appeal right. 
So the members of the public have the right to, to get those, that type of information through the right to know process. Uh, just one more comment, if I may. I, <clears throat> I know there's, uh, as I mentioned before, I've been in your position before as a member of the public. I'm a, I, my boys go to a Delaware County Public School District. I've been in your seat before as a member of the public. And I know they're, they're, we feel like we're taxpayers. We contribute to everybody's pay. Um, but I think we have to take a step back and understand that, as, as our board member here pointed out, that the, the district is governed by a school board. That's the governing body of the, of the institution. Now, it's not the, the business administrator, it's not the superintendent, it's not me as solicitor, it's the school board. And I, I think someone mentioned earlier about uh, business perspective, I think the gentleman left, but he has a business perspective, a business background. Can he's you imagine? The he's the, right there. Oh, there you are, okay, I'm sorry, I didn't see you. I'll see you again. <laughs> but I, I've, I'll just close and I'll stop uh, taking up more time, but just a inviting us to, stay, to take a step back and imagine what it would be like if every member of the public had the right to, to make a request of the business administrator directly for information. That business administrator would never get his or her job done. So that's not how it's set up. That's not how the process is set up. That's not how board wants the board, board school boards want to govern uh, it's their limited resources. Another quick thing that I'll uh, speak up again, forgive me for going on, but uh, I um, on our agenda tonight was a very large real estate tax assessment appeal settlement. The person who deserves credit for that is our business administrator. If you are trying to decide what he is worth, it's not only the budget, it's also all the money he saves our district and all the revenue he brings into our district. He is the one in charge of real estate tax appeals. And he, he is the one who guides the fight uh, against um, a property owner trying to squeeze out too much or the district making sure that we get our fair share. So please evaluate his worth according to everything that he does. That, is my two cents, but I thought that I should speak up and, and, uh, and point that out. Thank you, Mr. Bilker. Mr. President, a couple questions over here, if I may, um, before the next comment. My question is for, for, for Mr. Driscoll. Um, Mr. Driscoll, how many years have you been a school administrator, and how many years have you been an employee of the Marple Newtown School District? I've been a school administrator for 33 years. And I've been in Marple Newtown twice, so in total, close to 23 years. Do the other school administrators in the 500 districts have, how many of the other school administrators in the other 500 districts have the same amount of uh, experience as you do? If you know, I, I I wouldn't even be able to speculate. I just don't know. I mean, I can around us. I know, you know, in the county. I mean, sooner or later, somebody becomes the oldest person in the room. But you know, for the whole entire state, I don't know that. Hi, I'm Nancy Campo John. Um, I have lived in the district for over 32 years. I worked at Paxton Hall Middle School for almost 10 taught some of your children. I worked alongside some of you um, sitting in front of me and sitting behind me. Um, I worked with some extremely highly qualified uh, teachers and administrators with a lot of integrity, a lot to bring to our students um, past, present, and hopefully future. I just want to kind of get us back on track. Um, a lot of people spoke much more eloquently than I can. Um, I did a little bit of research about our mission statement, the district mission statement and core values, and 
taking a piece of it is um, we are dedicated to recruiting, retaining, and revering highly qualified staff as a means of providing rigorous educational opportunities for all students. We need to pay our teachers. I, uh, oh, excuse me, this is not, um, this is out of my comfort zone, but um, I left the district, I left teaching last year for, for personal reasons, but um, it was not an easy decision to make. There are so many qualified teachers that we are in danger of losing. We have the money. You admitted we have the money. I live in the district. I would not be opposed to having a slight increase in taxes. We need to retain our teachers. It is a nationwide teacher shortage that we're dealing with. It is. But we need to pay teachers. If we're going to lose 83% of our teachers, how are we going to get, retain, recruit highly qualified teachers if we don't pay them? Simple as that. We're all, we all have the same goal. We have the money. We have qualified teachers. Let's keep them. Let's pay for them. Let's, you know, honor them. Teachers have the same issues that we all have. We have bills to pay. We have mortgages. We have rent. We have children. We have finances that we have to attend to. And we can't sacrifice our family's needs to stay in a district that's not paying us appropriately. Thank you very much. I just had one thing. So, um, Mr. Serini, is that the proper way to pronounce your name? Yes. Okay. Thank you. I, I, I you're from Italy. <laughs> and I'm not. <laughs> um, anyway, I, I did have to chuckle a little bit when you said if people kept on emailing him all day, he would never get his job done. So I teach high school. The parent interference with the high school teacher is much less than when I was a middle school teacher. Raise your hand if you are an elementary school teacher. All right. How many parent emails do you get per day? <laughs> like, I got to say, like, I, I'm not too naggy with, with my daughter's teacher in second in first grade, but, like, I messed up which way she was supposed to go. And my little girl gets to the right spot every day after school. But um, the amount of things that come constantly change, change, change to teachers every single day, I just, that comparison, I just wanted to bring that up, that teachers deal with that all the time. And we, like, I, I have a giant stack of labs I did on Friday with my kids, and they are still sitting in my backpack at home because I'm here, and I miss it. But I try to do it because things get pushed back, and then there's a mental crisis. I have to deal with that. And then there's another IEP meeting, then I have to deal with that. But um, that happens in a teacher's day-to-day -day thing, and it carries over to their weekends and everything like that. So I just wanted to add that little comment. Thank you. Anyone else? Hi, how are you? My name is Beth Mara. I'm a Broomill uh, resident. I don't have anything prepared because I didn't plan to speak tonight, but I just wanted to say as I was sitting here, I'm a 20-plus year teacher and a parent, obviously. Um, I have three kids in the district. They're in elementary, middle, and high school. Uh, I truly respect this district. I respect what you do. I thank you for doing it. But most of all, I respect the teachers of this district, and it is imperative that we pay them. Um, again, I am familiar with the surrounding districts, so I don't think they're asking for anything that is out of line. We're not asking to go Laura Marion. We're asking for Springfield. We're asking for Havertown, you know. So we're just looking for, or not we're, I'm saying like, like I'm a teacher for the district. I'm just a teacher. But I'm saying I think what they're asking for is fair. And I really feel very passionate about retaining the special teachers that my kids have had through the district. Um, I just find that anything that will make it work is fine with me. I don't, I'm, I know this is just my opinion, but tax increases, if there is a surplus, not a surplus, I'm not a numbers person. I'm just looking for fairness for the teachers and most of all, a great education for my children. Thank you. All right, uh, of course. Hi, my name is Diana Ewan. I have a daughter in first grade at Loomis, and I was here last month, and I got an initial taste of what you all do, so thank you so much for what you do. I guess I do want to go back to a comment that you made, Mr. Siani. Yeah, just about acknowledging 
that Mr. Driscoll should get paid for his value and for his work. And I think we would agree that is the same sentiment that we're asking for our teachers to get. Yeah. Terms of remembering that, and I don't—I don't mean to suggest that you're not. I'm just saying that's, I think, what we're just kind of acknowledging today. I so I think at the last meeting that I attended, it was expressed that the the board needs to be considerate of its stakeholders and their their concerns, and that at the end of the day, any increase would be requested for the teachers is going to re result in a tax increase. I think you've heard that there's a lot of stakeholders here today that. We might not be getting it right. We might not know exactly what's involved. But I think the sentiment is we're willing to do the tax increase if that really needs to happen. I think we would just like to see some more transparency. And maybe the transparency is there, and we're just not understanding it. Um, so I think we would just ask for you to really kind of look at the community. I think we all want the same. Um, I think we all want the same thing at the end of the day. I think, Matt, it was you who said at the last meeting, we don't want an us versus them. And I think at the end of the day, we just have to kind of remember that. And maybe both sides don't just fight for, I want to win, but like, let's just do what's right. And I think at the end of the day, paying our teachers what they're worth is what's right. My name's Bridget Wendell. Uh, I live on Academy Lane in Marple Township, and I have children who attend a district elementary school. We live in Laurel. Um, I just wanted to say, uh, I saw someone come up, they had uh, the word inclusion on their shirt. Uh, inclusion uh, can mean a lot of things. Uh, I'm here to ask that the school please submit a proposal for Pennsylvania's Disability Inclusive Curriculum Pilot Program. Uh, it involves the school district coming up with a proposal, submitting it by, I believe, uh, May 15th. And it would involve the school district receiving grant money for three consecutive school years, beginning with the upcoming school year, 2023-2024. Did get a response when I emailed out um, that the district was aware of the pilot program, but they await details from the Pennsylvania Department of Education. And I would just ask that the school district please not just wait for someone to reach out. Please be proactive. Um, I think it's within your realm of, of capabilities to please be proactive and reach out to get more details on what's involved in coming up with this proposal. I uh, know that there are a number of local business people on this board who are probably really good at answering RFPs, right? Um, I would ask that you please tap um, the expertise of those volunteers uh, on our school board whose efforts, uh, those of us in the community, we really appreciate a lot. Um, it would be great. It would be an offer for the school district to get the grant money um, based on a, a proposal that they would submit. Um, I'm especially reminded uh, of a conversation, I believe it was in the last school board general meeting, where the school district, uh, for some reason, had not submitted certain paperwork. Title I. Title I. Uh, the loss <clears throat> of the reading specialists at Russell Elementary um, due to not filing Title I paperwork. Um, I think I'm not alone in hoping that the school district please uh, submit this proposal in a timely fashion. Again, it's due May 15th. Um, if you could please work on that, that would be great. Um, right to know requests came up uh, a few minutes ago. Uh, I remember I submitted a right to know request, I think in August of 2020, uh, for a school board recording. It was sent to me on a CD-ROM. <laughs> Can you guys think back to August of 2020? Who had a working computer with the CD-ROM? Because I needed your phone number back then. <laughs> because it was of no use to me. The school district resent me the um, school board meeting, or I think they resent me the school board meeting on um, a USB drive, which is like about this size, right? Probably a little less bulky. In an unpadded envelope through the US mail with the forever stamp on it. How do you think that went? It didn't arrive. There was a hole in the envelope. 
So somewhere out there, probably in the bottom of one of those sorting bins in, the po in, in a post office somewhere is a jump drive. Um, I, would, I would like for the school district to please, when they answer right to no requests, please uh, provide them in a format that modern technology um, can read and interpret. And if you could please, if you're going to mail out jump drives, please mail them in a padded envelope. Um, I also wanted to bring up, there's this great quote from a movie. Came out in the year 2000, um, Traffic. Do you guys remember? It had Catherine Zeta-Jones in it and Michael Douglas. And there was this great scene. I can't remember even when in the morning, when in the movie it was. But Michael Douglas was in it and then a very distinguished looking gentleman in a military uniform. I think Michael Douglas was going to this gentleman for advice. And the gentleman, they were sitting down in a very nice office, the gentleman was talking about when a ruler was forced out. And now I'm going to quote. He sat down and wrote two letters and gave them to his successor. He said, when you get yourself into a situation you can't get out of, open the first letter and you'll be safe. When you get yourself into another situation you can't get out of, open the second letter. Well, soon enough, the guy found himself in a tight place. I'm still quoting. Um, so he opened the first letter, which said, blame everything on me. So he blames the old man. It worked like a charm. He got himself into a second situation he couldn't get out of. He opened the second letter and said, sit down and write two letters. Mm. Um, it was. That, and that was really a great movie. And I think it was panned critically, but I think it made up for it in box office. Anyway, I'm bringing up that quote because I've heard, um, I think, the committee meeting, the last school board meeting, and in this school board meeting, um, the current pickle uh, with the teacher's salaries has been attributed by several people on the dais as uh, being the result of years of conservative fiscal management of the school board's budget. Am I characterizing the remarks correctly? That was the first envelope. I think it's time to open the second envelope. Thank you for your time and all you do for the school district. Could you please do it for the teachers? <laughs> uh, Mrs. Wendell, in, in, in relation to the inclusion grant, um, it's nothing we have to go search for, just so that you understand. All of our grants, Pennsylvania Department of Education has a portal. All of the grants are within the portal. They have not opened that portal for us yet. It's I not did even get there. It. Um, so we have um, the, the IU, the Delaware County IU doesn't know yet. Patan yeah. doesn't know yet. Everybody's looking for it. So it's not that we have to go search for it and find it. It should be in our portal when they push it out to the school districts. So. I just want to explain that. It's not something we would miss, so to speak. If it's not in our portal, we can't apply for it. So I'm ho we're, we've been looking in there um, for it to be posted. That is great information. Uh, thank you. Uh, I did get an email from Carol Clancy, who's the director of the Bureau of Special Education for the state. And uh, she said, this grant should be released shortly. Right. It's a short and sweet message, right? <laughs> A woman of few words. Yes, and she sent that late last week. Right. So, so when, it, I am really hopeful that you'll be seeing that in the portal soon. Right. We see it in our portal. And we're in our portal like every day. We're, we're always in that portal. So um, as soon as we see it, we can figure out what the criteria is for us to apply. Okay. And I think that's just really important, again, with the loss of the Title I funding um, because uh, something didn't get filed. It just, um, I used to work for the Crozier Health System. And what you heard about what's happening recently at Crozier, they're not doing so hot. Uh, but I remember when I worked there, and it was back, uh, I think I left there in early 2016. They had missed out on funding from the uh, tobacco settlement. Each state apparently got an allotment of that humongous settlement from all the big, you know, RJR Reynolds and 
all the big tobacco companies. And that really, that really hurt the, the health system. And I, I really feel like missing out on that Title I funding maybe didn't hurt the district that much. It definitely hurt Russell Elementary and the students of Russell Elementary. And I was just thinking earlier in this meeting, you're talking about the Reading Olympics. I think, like, what if there are some kids at Russell Elementary who can't participate as fully in the Reading Olympics because they're behind in their reading because the special education isn't there for them. And can I clarify about that? It's not that the district, there's no administrative error. What happens is parents fill out free and reduced lunch applications. Mm -hmm. We then take them and have to provide them to the federal program system. Mm -hmm. They then approve if you're free, reduced, or rejected. Mm -hmm. And then they tell us if we qualify. So we didn't make any error, and we did not provide them with the information given to us from our families. So I just want to clear the air about that. That's, that's a misunderstanding. OK, I'm sorry for that misunderstanding. Misunderstanding, Mr. Serini. Yeah. So, so, it, so that, that is what happened. I had a theory, my own personal theory, my own personal theory was that um, pa families just didn't fill out the paperwork in my, because they were, their children were getting free breakfast and lunch. Mm -hmm. So that was just my own personal theory. They never told us, hey, we're going we're gonna to count this year. We didn't know uh, because they had, they had, we had been using the pre-COVID um, paperwork. So mm -hmm. that, they tell us from federal programs. Mm -hmm. So that just gives you a little more clarification. I'm hearing some comments. Did anyone want to <laughs> take, the, take the mic? Here, step up. I'm sorry. Last month you were talking about Title Thank I money. So, so, okay. Well, it's just a point of clarification. Um, last month you folks said you were down one um, reading, writing specialist at Russell. Was that right? Yeah. Well, I was told and I heard, and I think I know there was an email from December of 2022 that all you were CC'd on that says you're down three. So let's make this constructive, right? We're not a perfect union. We're not a perfect society. We're certainly not a perfect community but we strive together as one. And on that note, the OT that my son is supposed to receive, he hasn't received it since December because the school district hired a contractor. So in the fall, stand by, in the fall, he had four different contractors, all of them quit. And since December, I guess up recently you guys have hired someone new. So my son in his early childhood development, where he should be receiving these things, the OT for his speech, which has led to frustration with his other studies, which he should be entitled to, he hadn't had it since December. I think we all can do better, and the way it gets better is to pay these teachers what their damn salary should be. I'll be short and sweet, I promise. My husband's at home with three small kids. Not a good thing. Um, I can talk to, as experience with Title I. My daughter's third grade, I actually have three girls, two, um, kindergarten, third grade. My third grade daughter benefit a lot from Title I. It was dropped. She had to get an IEP this year. There was one Title I teacher, one. And she told me that if you didn't drop the program or whatever happened with the program, she wouldn't have had to get the IEP. I'm also speaking from experience, lived here 27 years. I went through Marple, K through 12. Mrs. Payne, who taught my third grader, who is now teaching my kindergartner, orientation, walking through with my oldest. She stops, points at me, and goes, I know you. And I said, yeah, I had you at Mrs. Miller her first year there. An amazing experience to have my kids go through. Mr. Reardon, I had Mr. Reardon. There's plenty of teachers at that at these schools that I had. And it's great. I want my kids to have this. We all want our kids to have this. We want veteran teachers to stay here. As Justine said, her daughter's going to kindergarten. I'm sure our daughters will be together at kindergarten. I want Mrs. Bain to be there with my third daughter. So I just hope, I hope that you give these teachers what they deserve. Not what they want, what they deserve, because they deserve it. And we deserve to keep them here. So, thank you.
I just have two small comments. I'm so sorry. I know you look like you have to go to the bathroom really bad or something. <laughs> <laughs> Um, with the Title I, I, I mean, I don't know how we can blame the parents because I remember in, well, or saying it wasn't an administrative mistake because I remember it, it was a part-time job getting paperwork in elementary school, from school, different colors, it got brighter, it got darker, it got red. Um, I almost bought five yearbooks because of all the emails you get to keep reminding you. So it should have been made sure that that got done. Um, the other thing is, if we're worried about retention, do you guys conduct exit interviews when people do retire and or, or leave? We do. We do conduct exit interviews. Not necessarily for retirees because we right. know why they're leaving. Um, but still, they would, I mean, maybe help with well, we have multiple conversations with retirees for various reasons. So if they certainly want to comment something to us, which they do, they're they're love, they're wonderful people. You hate to see them leave. They do say things to us. Um, but those who have resigned and went to a different district, yes, we often have exit interviews with those people, not just teachers, but also your right. classified support personnel. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. you all for your time. You're dismissed, Mr. President. <laughs> No, I, I do have one. I oh, do have one I'm more sorry. thing. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, I was just speaking with a parent um, who is listening to the meeting. Unfortunately, wasn't able to attend. Whose um, child does uh, receive um, free breakfast and lunch? And she said that she, for whatever reason, received the form too late. And by the time she was able to fill it out and get it in, it was too late to submit it. And I don't know where that error happened. Um, but I, I don't either because it did. It goes home back to school night. It's on our website. Our principals put it in periodically as reminders. Our home and school visitor reaches out to people. We survey the, the our list of people with outstanding balance. So I mean, well, we we can try to send it home more frequently. I mean, I'm not blaming anyone. Right. I'm just saying. Right, but that, Loomis has it, so obviously they got. Right, they were and we've the had it in situation. the past. Yeah, yeah, right? we've had it in the past. Um, but we don't determine. We don't somewhere. determine <laughs> the, the. We don't qualify ourselves. It's qualified. So perhaps by going programs. forward, we could maybe suggest doing a little more education of the parents about why they need to fill it out and why it's important that it gets filled out. Because I think we, as a parent, I get so much paper home, so much, and if I feel like it doesn't really apply to me. Sometimes it gets overlooked, or maybe it does get put on the counter, and I see it a day too late. So perhaps educating the community on why we fill out this paperwork might also be an effective strategy. Great idea. We should look into that because yep. it can happen. You guys are better. <laughs> I do actually have a really quick question. <laughs> I'm like Columbo. <laughs> Does everyone remember Columbo? <laughs> I think you're all old enough to remember Columbo. Uh, a quick question for Mr. Orwick. Hi, Mr. Orwick. How, how much does it cost to recruit a new teacher and onboard them? Say that again? When you recruit new staff members, including teachers and, um, and educational assistants, like, the, um, like for example, some, someone who is going to work as a one-to-one. What are the costs to recruit? And the reason I'm asking that is is that um, I, I'm just wondering, like, how does that go into the overhead of the district? How does that go? I into can't even qual quantify that. Okay, I'm I'm, I'm hoping. <laughs> could you quantify that at the next meeting? A cost? How much does it cost to re recruit a new teacher? Like <sighs> There's spend, so like, many. Like, I'm spending the time to review. Oh, the that time? That, the, the time? Right, Personal the time, time? The time translated into like. How much that cost for us? I'm like too busy like recruiting to figure out that for you. I know, um, that is really, that's. But a, we have Talent Ed, which is a software program that almost every district uses, um, where you put out the job posting. And then from Talent Ed, we don't touch it, and Monster.com grabs it, Indeed grabs it. Mm -hmm. It goes out and hits all the job boards out there without us doing anything. Do you interview people when they apply? Yes. Okay, so that takes, does that take time? 
significant amount of time. Okay. So what, what I'm asking to clarify my request, I'm wondering, could you translate that time, that significant amount of time, um, to um, how much that costs per person you have to replace? What's your ultimate goal? What are you looking for? Uh, what's the overhead? That, um, that we could possibly reduce in the budget. That's the we job of the things. HR department. That's part of our job functions mm -hmm. to recruit individuals. I mean, there's... It's just, it's a lot of effort. Um, and there's only three of us. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a challenge. I'll, I'll tell you that. It's a very strong challenge. But to actually put a dollar on it, I, there's so many different ways that you recruit, you interview, the position dictates how much time you invest into it. Yes. So, for example, if there's a physics teacher that we need to recruit for, you're talking a significant investment of time. And are they only, um, I'm just wondering about the interview process, are they only interviewed by people in HR or are they interviewed by like other teachers, like maybe, maybe senior teachers? Teachers are not in the interview process. Yeah. The frontline supervisor, whoever that may be, it may be a spec ed director, uh, it may be the building principal. Um, it could be within the teaching and learning department. Um, HR can sit in, um, but we typically don't sit in on first round, so there's typically three rounds of interviews. Uh, I, I, it just goes on and on. I mean, for teachers, they have to do a sample lesson in front of a committee before they get recommended for hire. Um, it, it's what HR does. It's, it's what we do. cheaper to retain than it is. Uh, yes. <laughs> Ingrid, well next time, next time, can you get up? Right. It's probably cheaper to retain. I, I can't even quantify your, your request to quantify the hiring process into a dollar amount. It's commonly done in, in a business setting. Um, I think well, they must the be business more knowledgeable than I then to, to quantify. To but, um, we'll give it a shot. That's all I can tell you is I'll give it a shot, but it, it's going to vary from position to position it, it you know if we're recruiting I mean, a bus driver or we're recruiting a physics teacher there's a large variance between the two I'm sure there's a huge variance between the two um, I, I mean I, I think it's it's my opinion is that it's well accepted um, throughout most organizations um, that it is cheaper to in the long run it's cheaper to retain than to constantly hire and retrain, hire and retrain. It could be. It could be. It, there's too many factors for me to even factor into a, a formula that you're asking for. I think the point is taken, though. Okay, thanks. Thank you, ma'am. Oh, Martha. I know. Sorry, Matt. <laughs> it's been years since you've seen me. <laughs> Hi, I'm Martha Davis uh, from Marple, and I wasn't going to speak because I don't have anything prepared. Everybody said what I wanted to say, but there is one point that was mentioned briefly that needs some attention. You voted at the last meeting to accept the block schedule for next year. So I'm not a teacher, but I'm imagining that most of your high school teachers will be spending at least a portion of their summer redoing their lesson plans, reconfiguring, bringing in new ideas, hopefully now that they have larger blocks of time, more interactive lessons. I'm assuming they're going to be doing that over part of their summer because they love their job and they're dedicated to our students and you've asked them to move to this semester-based schedule. Um, if we're heading into June and there's no contract, my guess is that they might be even more inclined to look at a different district that won't have them doing all of that work in preparation for a job where they don't feel appreciated. So I just wanted to point that out as another reason to get this contract done and done quickly before they decide that that's not how they want to spend their summer. Thank you. Yep. All right. Uh, comments from the board? Tony? So I've seen the movie Traffic. <laughs> and I, I do recognize that, that reference to that line. And I know the context of that line it was a story about the Soviet premier Nikita Khrushchev as he was being forced from power. So I, um, when, a member of the, when a member of the public comes up and says to the school board, open the second envelope, 
I don't know what that implies if you're saying that the nine of us should just should just leave. But we're here serving. And you know, I think a comment like that, it's your right to make, but I think it really belittles the effort that, that Matt Bilker and Dave Desi, who are the school boards and negotiators, I think that comment demonstrates a misunderstanding of how much work he's putting into this and he's putting into this. I think a comment like that belittles the efforts that they're making. I think when, when our school board president puts his proposal out to the teachers' union, the Marple Newtown Education Association, I think that's one of the most transparent things a school board president could do. Um, for months, we've been just reading social media claims, and many of them have named him directly um, and spoken about his, his narrative. So I'm disheartened by that as someone who's new to this process. I mentioned this at the, at the committee meetings. I've, my association with Mr. Bilker, as was mentioned earlier, goes all the way back to when we were both in school. When he says he wants to raise the salaries, he means it, and it's demonstrated in what we offer. He's when he says he's trying to get to an agreement, when he says he's trying to get to a settlement, he means it. Uh, I don't walk out that door ever second-guessing what the gentleman at the center of this table is saying tonight, because I know him, and not just through the school board. And I don't think anyone should really, th th no one has any reason, there's no reason for anyone to, to walk out that door and think he, he's not being on the, the up and up. I just, uh, I just don't think that that's, that's fair. I don't think that's even accurate. So um, that's my comment about that. The reason I had asked Mr. Driscoll about the amount of time he's been an employee is because I think it does add some context to why his salary is where it is, and it's something that no one else has, to my knowledge, brought up. You spend 30 years as a school administrator, most of it in the same place, and you renegotiate your contract with boards past over and over, it's, 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 it's going to be uh, an accumulation. And as I've listened to Mr. Driscoll answer many of the questions tonight, uh, he's, been, he's been very patient. He's answered several of the questions. He's taken time to answer the questions. He's answered questions both from the audience and from the board. And I mean, I think that demonstrates that he is the individual with the credentials he has for a reason. This is a very well-run school district. People move here primarily to the Marple Newtown School District because this is a well-run school district. And one piece of that puzzle is, is the gentleman who's sitting over there to your right or your left, depending on where you're sitting. So, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know him outside of this, uh, outside of this board, but, but I mean, I think you demonstrated why you are the, the business manager of this school district tonight. I really do. Um, but I, I do want to quickly respond to that, please. I, I guess, I, is it okay to speak for a moment? Because I appreciate how much you value someone who has 30 years in this district. But why aren't you valuing teachers who have 30 years the same? I don't think They're that's, trying to. I don't think You're that's not, accurate. Because he's oh, making more that's... than any other business manager, which is fine. Your teachers are making much less, including ones with 30 years of experience. So I don't understand the. I don't think that's that's accurate. That that our negotiating team does not value teachers who have put thirty years of experience. I don't think that's accurate. I just want to end though your argument. And correct me if I'm wrong. Your argument is that he deserves his salary because of his expertise and his experience, which I am not at all debating. I'm asking you why you don't feel the teachers who have put thirty years in with a high level of so, expertise don't yeah. earn the same. I, I reject the premise of that question because it's not true. Right, the it's same in comparison true. to other right. teachers. It's not true that I don't think teachers who have, have put in, and I don't think it's true for our negotiating team either, that they don't think teachers who have put in that amount of time don't deserve an increase. The, we are looking to increase the salaries. That's what we have proposed. It's an increase. I guess I'm asking why he makes more than any other business manager in the area. Do, do you see the disconnect? Do you guys see it or, or no? 
And I don't care that he does. I'm ha I, I really do appreciate everything you do, Mr. Driscoll, and it does seem like you're working very hard. We appreciate that. We want to know why you value him and you are not valuing teachers with the same level of experience and expertise. I reject the claim that we're not valuing teachers. You all the feel teachers. the same? You all I agree? I, I want to be, I want to give this process a shot because I believe. So you're going to continue negotiating? You do not give I, your. I, I'm not getting into that. I believe our proposal, I believe our proposal checks a lot of the boxes that, that you folks have brought up tonight. All right. Your, your teachers and the community here feels differently. All right, on that front, Anybody else? We are uh, the next committee meeting. Uh, we need to move it from Tuesday, April 11th to Wednesday, April 12th. All right, a couple of board directors have conflicts. We want to try to make it. Okay? All right. With that, we'll adjourn.